Hi, my name is Jordan Marshall. I'm the Chief Reporter at Building Magazine and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Um, it's a really good one we have planned for you this afternoon. Um, it's a CPD accredited presentation on passive fire protection for structural steel. Um, I'd like to welcome Coral Morgan, who's a product manager at Rockwell, who will be taking us through today's presentation for the first portion of the session. Um, it's also a really great opportunity that we have a Q&A section at the end of the presentation. So please feel free um, to send those through at any point during the presentation. I'll do my best to cover up as many of them as possible. We have a lot of people watching today, so I imagine there'll be a lot of questions, um, but we'll try and cover up as many as possible. Also, the session will be available on demand because I'm sure there'll be plenty of information and plenty of people who want to have another look. Um, but that's probably enough for me to kick things off. So Coral, I will hand over to you. I'll turn off my screen and mute myself for now, and then I'll um, speak to you again at, during the Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Jordan. Um, welcome, everybody. I will um, launch straight into the um, today's presentation for you. Um, it is quite lengthy, so I'm trying to get through it as quickly as possible uh, without rushing it too much so that we do have a question and answer session at the end. Um, obviously, any questions that we can't answer in the session, we will take a note of and we will try and get back to you um, as well as soon as possible after this presentation. I am going to switch my camera off because I'm sure you would like to see the presentation rather than me all the time. So um, switching that off now. OK, so we will start now. So um, as our cities grow taller and our buildings more ambitious, steel frame construction is becoming an increasingly important construction method. And it's one that poses unique challenges when it comes to fire safety. Ensuring a building meets the requirements of approved document B, passive fire protection is integral when safeguarding structural stability and safely protecting occupants and firefighting teams. That said, in modern building standards, acoustic and thermal performance are also increasingly coming to the fore. And with these criteria often considered later in the build programme, there are common challenges faced which impact project timescales and costs. Passive fire protection for structural steel can help to balance design demands as well as delivering built-in structural steel fire protection. It, to understand passive fire protection solutions for structural steel, we need to look at the history and the journey to where we have got to now. So in 1880, the UK insurance industry, represented by the British Insurance Association, uh, now known as the Association of British Insurers, formed the Fire Officers Committee for the purpose of insurance tariff setting and technical support. In 1896, the first steel frame construction in the UK uh, was built, which was the Royal Insurance Building in Liverpool. In the 1920s, the standard time temperature fire curve uh, was standardised and that covers the cellulose as we know it today as a cellulosic fire curve. The curve represents a fire in its phase of full development. Um, the standard fire curve is used for testing and classification of passive fire protection systems for buildings, for example, fire protection of load bearing structures, compartmentation and also fire stopping. In 1932, the BS476 standard was first published. When designing a building, a very important consideration is how it will behave in fire and ensure the elements of structure will not collapse but remain standing or hold back the fire for a prescribed time. The British Standard 476 dictates the appropriate fire test for these elements of structure, materials and grades the level of fire resistance. In 1946, uh, the Fire Protection Association was established uh, and was the UK's national fire safety organisation. It works to identify and draw attention to the dangers of fire and the means by which their potential for occurrence and loss is kept to a minimum. This is recognised as an independent and authoritative source of fire safety information and advice. In 1967, the Iron and Steel Act brought into public ownership about 90% of British steelmaking. In 1975, the Association of Specialist Fire Protection, the ASFP, um, Bod trade, the UK advisory trade body was founded to represent, support and promote the activities and key issues affecting the fire protection industry in the UK and increasingly internationally in relation to all forms of passive fire protection in the built environment. It is recognised as one of the UK's leading authorities on the importance, specification, procurement and installation of passive fire protection products. In 1995 and 1997, the Cardington fire tests were carried out. 
So these were a series of large scale fire tests conducted in real structures, wood, steel, concrete, composite and concrete. And the results from these tests underpin much of the modern science of structural fire engineering in steel frame buildings with composite steel deck floors. In 2004, the Eurocode series of European standards related to construction, Eurocode 3, design for steel structures, um, describes how to design steel structures. It was approved by the European Committee for Standardization um, in April 2004, and it comprises 20 documents dealing with the different aspects of steel structure design. In 2008, BS 9999, which is the Code of Practice for Fire Safety in the Design, Management and Use of Buildings, providing recommendations and guidance on the design, management and use of buildings to achieve acceptable levels of fire resistance for people in and around buildings. It detailed ways, details ways in which fire safety legislation can be complied with through a more flexible design approach. In 2010, the EN Eurocodes um, were uh, providing a common approach for the design of buildings and other civil engineering works and construction products um, were introduced. Um, um, they are recommended the reference for technical specifications in public contracts. So hopefully from today's um, presentation, you will gain an understanding um, of the following. So we will be looking at the history of steel design. We've covered some of that in the journey to now, but also considering the different types of steel construction. We're gonna to look to gain an understanding of why protecting structural steel is important and understand the key regulations, the standards and the guidance available. Uh, we will also review the key differences between the BS and the EN test standards and find out what solutions Rockwell have available. So to begin, we will look at the history of steel construction, the benefits and types of construction where steel can be used. So the Bessemer process in 1855 was the first inexpensive industrial process for the mass production of steel and made steel production more efficient. Steel began to replace iron as a major construction material and by 1880, the era of construction based on reliable mild steel began. Steel frame is a building technique with a skeleton frame of vertical steel columns and horizontal beams to provide structural support. The father of modern steel making was a Briton named Henry Bessemer, who in 1856 announced the description of the process, which bears his name, which would eventually produce steel more cheaply and more importantly in larger quantities. The home insurance building in Chicago was completed in 1885, was the first to use the skeleton frame construction, relying on its masonry clad in for stability. It weighed a third as much as it would have in stone. The Tacoma or the flat iron building in Chicago completed in 1889 was the first skyscraper with non load bearing curtain walls by using the Bessemer beams and steel cages that supported the building's weight. The Royal Insurance building in Liverpool erected in 1896 was the first to use a steel frame in the United Kingdom. And it was this skeleton frame technique which has made the construction of high rise skyscrapers possible. The versatility of steel framing allows for a variety of uses. Um, it can be used for infill framing, for fabricated modular buildings, for structural steel, for high rise, industrial or warehouse buildings because of its ability to be able to create large open spaces at low cost, residential buildings using light gauge steel construction and temporary structures as these are quick to set up and easy to pull, take back down. With steel, we can create structures like no other material when it comes to construction. And structural steel has undoubtedly become the preferred choice for construction due to the various benefits it has. The buildings that are made from steel require various structural frames. Also, construction with steel entails much less time, which makes it the most sought after way of constructing structures. And the growth, as we we're saying, in high rise curtain wall style buildings has increased due to the flexibility in design through the use of steel. There are three basic types of steel construction. So we can have wall bearing construction, which is normally used for low rise residential or factory buildings, where external or internal walls are used to support structural members. So for example, beams and joists, which support the floors and the roof. We can have a skeleton construction, which is normally used for the high rise developments. All loads are carried by a structural frame skeleton. 
and the exterior walls are non-load-bearing curtain walls. We can have long span construction and this type of construction is generally used for auditorium, stadiums, exhibition halls, manufacturing and aircraft hangars, allowing for the creation of unobstructed column-free spaces greater than 30 metres. Buildings that are not primarily used for storage, for example, offices, residential schools and hospitals have a high percentage of non-permanent loads. Within offices, residential units, schools and hospitals, the structural Euro code assumes that a proportion of the built design load will not be present at the time of a fire as the building will have been evacuated and loading will vary potentially throughout the day and night. Other types of buildings such as warehouses and libraries are primarily used for storage so a high percentage of that load is permanent. The codes allow for no reduction in design load in the event of a fire. And fire testing standards effectively base the failure criteria for load bearing elements on strength. So structural steel is a versatile, strong and durable uh, material. It's hardly surprising that it can be transformed into almost any shape based on the construction project at hand. And it can be utilised almost immediately the moment it's received on the building site. Structural steel is fire resistant in itself, but fire protection methods should be put in place in case there is a possibility of the steel heating up to a point where it starts to lose its durability and its strength in a fire situation. So structural steel comes in various shapes like um, L beams, Z shapes, um, hollow sections, um, structural channels, T shapes, rail profiles, bars, rods, plates and open joist web steel, castellated and cellular beams. So cellular beams are built with circular patterns for holes. Um, we've separated this one out because cellular beams are becoming ever more popular um, in the construction industry. Um, and they can be defined usually because they all usually have circular patterns for holes, whereas the castellated beams or sections um, were built with hexagonal um, holes. Cellular beams are often used to facilitate long spans, resulting in flexible column-free internal spaces, reduce substructure costs and shorter steel erection times. Cellular beams are more suitable for use as long span secondary beams than for primary beams as the sheer capacity of the web is considerably weakened by the openings. Distributing services within the structural zone through the use of beams with web openings leads to economies in the construction by reducing the floor to floor height, which has the double benefit of reducing the external cladding required and also reducing heat loss through the envelope. In multi-storey buildings, service integration can allow extra floors to be provided within the same overall building height and careful layout of the structural elements can lead to flexibility in service distribution and ease of future maintenance. Cellular beams are growing in popularity due to the fact that the services can be accommodated through them, reducing the amount of space that is utilised. Moving on to steel protection and the requirements for protecting structural steel. So why do we need to protect steel? Building regulations require that buildings should be designed and constructed so that their stability will be maintained for a reasonable period. So buildings therefore should not collapse prematurely, allowing sufficient time for occupants to escape safely and for the fire service to obtain access. In most modern buildings, the load bearing function is provided by a steel framework to which the rest of the building is attached. The extent to which an element requires fire resistance will depend upon factors such as its size, the height, the use and the occupancy of the building and the function of the element. Passive fire protection delays the collapse of the structure by insulating the structural steel columns and beams that support the building fabric. So the frame needs to be protected from fire because steel will soften at a high temperature. The load bearing capacity of the structural steel must be maintained to prevent the building from collapsing. And in the case of columns, this is usually done by encasing it in some form of fire resistant structure, such as masonry, concrete or plasterboards. So there are two types of steel fire protection that can be used. Uh, you can have non-reactive and reactive. Um, fire protection. So steel beams may be encased in concrete, plasterboard, fire protection insulation or sprayed with a coating to insulate it from the heat of a fire or it can be protected by a fire resistant ceiling construction. 
Non-reactive fire protection can consist of plaster or cementitious coatings, uh, which are generally sp spray or trowel applied, following the shape of the element, profiled or boxed by applying to pre-installed metal lath. Alternatively, solid protection applied directly to the surface of the element and filling in the void of the web area. So these systems can be designed to be used internally or externally in exposed environments, and these can tolerate hydrocarbon as well as cellulosic fires. Board systems generally are generally used to box in section and are used uh, for use internally. You may be able to be used in sheltered external applications, um, or they would need to be overclad to be weather protected. They are meant to remain in place without change in structure for the fire period and absorb heat to maintain the steel temperature below the critical or the limiting temperature. Fixing methods may affect the actual fire rating and thickness of protection, which is required. Reactive fire protection projects consist of intumescent coatings, and these are paint-like materials which are inert at low temperatures, but which will provide insulation as a result of a complex chemical reaction at temperatures typically of around 250 to 275 degrees C. At these temperatures, the properties of the steel will not be affected. And as a result of this reaction, they swell and provide an expanded layer of low conductivity char. Intumescent coatings can be divided into two broad families, either thin film or thick film uh, coatings. Thin film materials are mainly used for buildings, um, whereas thick film intumescent coatings were originally developed for the offshore and hydrocarbon industries, but they have been modified for use in today's buildings. So what happens if we leave steel unprotected? So steel generally begins to lose its strength at temperatures above 300 degrees C and eventually melt around about 1500 degrees C. Importantly for design, the greatest rate of heat of strength loss is in the range of 400 degrees to 600 degrees. It is necessary to limit the temperature rise to the steel with 550 degrees C being a conservative temperature, mainly due to the fact that concrete which it supports acts as a heat sink. Temperature variations through the cross section of the steel structural member will affect its performance in fire, with the difference being as much as 200 degrees C between the upper and the lower flanges. So structural steel will have a critical or limiting temp failure temperature dependent on the loading required of that member. The higher the critical temperature, the less fire protection the structure requires and vice versa. So the inherent fire resistance of the steel is related to the section, its degree of exposure to the fire and the load that it carries. And therefore the proposed method of protection to be used to protect the steel work will affect the surface area of exposed steel and the section factor to be calculated. In the new European testing and design standards, the section factor is presented as AV, which has the same numerical value as, as the old HP over A. It is likely that the designation HP over A will gradually fall into disuse. So A is equal to the surface area of the steel exposed to the fire per unit of length, and V represents the volume of the section per unit length. Essentially, it's the measure of how quickly the steel section will heat in a fire, and therefore how much fire protection is required. A low section factor equates to a strong section, which when unprotected will take longer to heat and to set to a set critical temperature than a relatively lighter weight section with a higher section factor. The steel section with the large surface area will heat up more than a section with a small surface area. In addition, the greater the volume of the section, the greater the heat sink, and therefore a smaller, thicker section will have a slower rate of temperature rise in a fire when compared to a large, thin one. Fire protection solutions can be applied in three ways. So sprayed materials would normally be applied to follow the profile of the section. Board materials would normally be used to form a box around the section. And concrete is generally used to form solid protection. So we will now look at the regulations, the standards and the testing which relate to structural fire protection for steel. So understanding the regulations and standards is the key to success. And unfortunately, a tragedy, tragedy such as Grenfell has highlighted again that it's important for those involved in construction to check and to understand the supporting data that is supplied for products, their application area and their performance. 
It is not acceptable to take products at face value, but to ensure that products will perform as expected for the given application. And therefore, it is important that product data and information is clearly communicated in plain, consistent and non-technical language. So we'll look now at the regulations, the standards and the testing and starting off with the approved documents. So in the Secretary of State's view, the requirement of B3 is met if for the defined periods, low bearing elements of structure withstand the effects of fire without the loss of stability. So each devolved UK government publishes guidance documents on how compliance with the building regulations can be achieved. It's important to note that there are separate building regulation guidance documents for each region of the UK and the sections of each which refer to the fire protection considerations for structural steel are uh, England and Wales approved document bear with me England and Wales approved document B fire safety um, B, requirement B3 internal fire spread for the structure structural fire resistance requirements in approved document B1 for multi-story buildings are contained in table B4 they are the function of the height of the building and the occupancy Within the Wales documents, um, it's very similar to um, the English approved document B, um, except that we have our own separate um, copy as such of the approved documents. Uh, Scotland, the building regulations, technical handbook. So unlike England and Wales, where periods of fire resistance of 120 minutes usually occur in buildings over 30 metres in height, in Scotland, this can occur at any height uh, if the compartment floor area is large enough. In Northern Ireland, the building regulations, uh, Northern Ireland technical booklet E contains date, data for uh, structural fire protection. They are broadly the same as those in approved document B and are a function of the height of the building measured in the same way as described for approved document B and the occupancy. The Republic of Ireland uh, has building regulations, fire safety, technical, doc, technical guidance document B and special provisions relating to shopping centres generally concerning structural fire protection are included. Each region approaches the regulations slightly differently, uh, but the fundamental principles of maintaining fire protection periods is clear across each document. Statutory regulations and design codes provide designers with prescribed periods of fire resistance to construction elements which give a safe period of, ac of evacuation, a safe period for firefighting, and provisions for property protection, structural stability of the building. The key takeaway from fire safety regulations across the UK is that the height, the occupancy and the function of the building are central to determining its required fire protection periods. Alternative and additional guidance. So BS999, um, is the guidance for a, a taking a fire engineering approach. So research in the UK and Europe has resulted in increased knowledge and improved understanding of fire behaviour and how risk is created in fire. It has therefore been recognised that the provision of the various approved documents, technical handbooks may not provide the most efficient solution for fire in many buildings. And this has led to an increase in the use of fire engineered solutions, especially for large or complex structures. The option of reduced fire ratings when sprinklers are installed is still available in BS 999 and is complemented by an alternative approach which classifies buildings according to a risk profile based on its occupancy, fire growth rate, ventilation conditions and the height. Eurocode 3 um, includes individual steel elements that can be calculated and specified for the specific application, taking into account the calculated loadings, the critical temperatures, etc., which provides the opportunity to exploit the properties of structural steel to its maximum capacity. The ASFP Yellow Book, 5th uh, edition, um, provides a comprehensive guide to the proprietary materials and systems which are manufactured marketed or site applied by ASFP members. The fifth edition now includes data relating to the new fire test and assessment methods from Europe. There are additional guidance documents which are more specific and related to property types and usage. For example, we have fire safety uh, guidance documents for hospitals or healthcare buildings and for schools, um, schools as such. 
So looking next at the key test standards for structural steel. So we have BSEN 13501 part one and part two. So these provide the reaction to fire classification procedures for all products and building elements. So the European classification standard ranks construction products materials in seven classes with regard to their reaction to fire behavior. So ranging from A1 down to F. And they will cover projects that have a, contrib a contribution to fire and are only able to resist ignition by a small flame for a short period. The fire classification specified in each of the product standards that enable products to be CE marked as required by the construction product regulation. 13501 part two specifies the procedure for classification of construction products and building elements using data from fire resistance and smoke leakage tests, which are within the direct field of application of the relevant test method. Classification on the basis of extended application of test results is also included in the scope of this European standard. BSEN 13381 part four is the test method for determining the contribution to the fire resistance of structural members. Um, it apply, it's applied passive fire protection products to steel members, and it specifies the test method for determining the contribution made by applied passive fire protection systems to the fire resistance of structural steel members, which can be used as beams or columns. EN 1365 part three and part four are the actual um, methods for determining the fire resistance of beams with or without um, fire applied fire protection systems and with or without cavities, um, with part three being for beams and part four being for load bearing columns. EN 15080 part eight is the extended application of results from fire resistance tests. So E and fire resistance test standards impose strict rules governing the use of tests to cover specific end use scenarios or what we would call the field of application. So based on the testing that is carried out, um, you will need to put, usually carry out more than one test um, for getting the scope of data for applied uh, fire protection to structural steel beams or columns. Uh, that test data is then taken um, and it is assessed and put into via the extended field of application standard. So following the rules that govern that. And it'll allow you, to, gives you then the scope of application for your product. So BS476 was the standard that we used to use. So the BS, as we discussed right at the beginning, the BS476 series of fire tests were the appropriate test standards, which were utilized in the UK prior to moving to a harmonized European standards and it was first published in 1932. So this, the BS476 standards dictate the appropriate fire test for elements of structure and materials and grades the level of fire resistance when subjected to the heating and pressure conditions specified in BS476 part 20. BS476 part 21, uh, fire resistance of load bearing elements of structure was prepared under the direction of the Fire Standards Committee and described the procedures for determining the fire resistance of load bearing elements of building construction, such as load bearing beams, columns, floors, flat roofs and walls. So beams and columns are assessed in terms of load bearing capacity, whilst divided in elements such as floors, flat roofs and walls are measured in terms of load bearing capacity, integrity and the insulation. So what are the key differences between the BS476 standards and the, B and the new harmonised European standards? So fire exposure. Um, the International Fire Testing Standard, ISO 834, is similar to the other standards and is in the process of being revised to bring it more in line with the European standard. And this uses the standard cellulose fire curve, which is designed to replicate a fire in a normal building. Temperature increase after 30 minutes is 842 degrees C. In a real life, uh, in a real fire, once the combustible material fire load has been consumed, the fire will decay and or move. In a standard fire test, the temperature rises quickly and increases indefinitely, so conditions are far more severe. The design temperature, a commonly held assumption was that 550 was the highest limited temperature that a steel structure could withstand before collapse. Research has shown, however, that the limiting temperature of a structural steel member is not fixed at 550, but will vary according to two factors, the temperature profile and the load. 
So BS standards allow for, sorry, BSEN standards allow for a range of design temperature data to be collected to support structural modeling of steel sections in order to calculate specific limiting temperatures for each individual structural element that is used. Temperature control uh, within the furnace has also changed. So BS476 utilizes small bead thermocouples, which respond very quickly to changes, especially in the early stages of a test. And they only require small increases in fuel input per unit change in temperature. Under the European standards, the plate thermocouples have been introduced, intended to reduce the differences between fire tests carried out in different furnaces and thus to promote European harmonization. The change to a plate thermocouple is designed to harmonize the exposure of furnaces across the EU and it results in a higher thermal exposure compared to the British standard, therefore is a more onerous heating regime. So plate thermocouples represent a large area to the furnace, which responds much more slowly than the smaller bead thermocouple. And consequently, to get the plate thermocouples to respond quickly requires inputting significantly greater amounts of energy into the furnace than is required when it's controlled by a bead thermocouple, especially during the first 30 minutes of exposure when compared to the BS test regime. Therefore, tests in furnaces controlled by the larger plate thermocouples will be much more severe than those controlled by the smaller, more responsive bead thermocouples, although both nominally follow the same time temperature relationship. The British standard beam test uses a segmented dense concrete slab in contact with the top flange of the beam, which results in a heat sink into the concrete slab. Additionally, under EN, the use of heavy concrete slab means that the load is applied to the slab rather than directly to the beam, which is similar to UK practice. The main difference under EN requirements is the application of insulation to the top of the beam and the, under the floor slab for loaded beams. This serves to reduce the heat sink effect of the slab and to minimize the effects of composite action. This prevents the heat sink into the concrete um, testing the reaction of the structural steel and allows for multi-temperature data to be collated. For non-composite beams where the load bearing flange is unrestrained and free to displace, lateral torsional buckling can occur. So this is the action of the beam twisting and bending when heated in a fire. Under EN testing, the load is applied to the floor slab, which helps to reduce this effect. In design, loadings and supports for beams will be calculated for the application. In addition, there have been several recent changes to failure or limiting temperatures in the UK industry. The ASFP Yellow Book Step 5 states these as Eurocodes Table 16 and 17 and BS 5950 Table 18 for all new specifications since the 1st of July 2019. Looking at the European requirements and the transition to the European um, regi testing regime. So the European single market referred to the EU as one territory without any internal borders or other regulatory ob obstacles to the free movement of goods and services. The main goal is to ensure the free movement of goods within the market and to set high safety standards for consumers and the protection of the environment. Um, obviously, we have now left um, the, e the European single market. Um, we're in the process of Brexit. Um, but for currently and ongoing for the moment, initially anyway, we will still remain uh, following the EU uh, fire test standards. Uh, the construction products regulation lays down harmonized rules for the marketing of construction products in the EU. Uh, and the regulation provides a common technical language to assess the performance of construction products. And the CPR is an EU regulation which sets conditions for the marketing of construction products and the use of CE marking. So, as I was saying, even though the UK has left the EU, changes are required to ensure that it operates effectively in the UK. The general policy is to keep the same requirements, but to convert them into a UK regime. The harmonised European standards provide a technical basis to assess the performance of construction products and they enable manufacturers to draw up a declaration of performance as defined in the construction products regulation and affix the CE mark. So um, what is required for product compliance? So we will have a harmonized European standard, um, which is uh, testing to a harmonized standard demonstrates that the product, service or processes comply with relevant EU legislation. 
They're voluntary, but remain the most robust method to show a product's compliance. In the absence of a harmonized European standard, you can assess a product to a European assessment document. So uh, formerly ETAGs, um, so technical approval guidelines, uh, were common approval guidelines under the Construction Products Directive. And since 2013, when the CPD was superseded by the Construction Products Regulation, they are in use as European assessment documents. All ETAGs have now been converted to EADs. Uh, from the EAD, we would have a European technical assessment, um, and it, which will describe the type of product it applies to, the list of essential characteristics in relation to the intended use, um, and the method and criteria for assessing the performance in relation to essential characteristics, and the principles for the applicable factory pr production control. So ETAs focus on the claims of the manufacturer. So in essence, the essential characteristics the manufacturer wants to declare in relation to its intended use. In the absence of the harmonized standard, we have the opportunity to certify, uh, certify via an ETA evaluated against an EAD. So from that, we can CE mark the product. Uh, and CE marking is an administra administrative mark that indicates conformity with health, safety and environmental protection standards for products sold within the European uh, Union. It is mandatory to CE mark construction products where a harmonized European standard exists. And CE marking is seen as a quality system that relates to the performance of the product, not that the product is approved for a specific application. The mark shows that the product fulfills the declared properties and that it is safe to use. From the CE marking, you would have a certificate of conformity, uh, which would be established by a third party, a notified body, or it can be issued by a manufacturer. The notified body checks that the manufacturer fulfills the declared values for the product and states that the product meets the required standards or specifications. A DOP or a declaration of performance is a key document for CE marking um, and is a key part of the construction products regulation. It provides information on the performance of a product and it will be issued by the manufacturer. These have to be made readily available and must be accessible to the general market. So each construction product covered by a European harmonized standard or for which a European technical assessment has, has been issued will, need, will have a DOP. So, so the harmonized standards provide a method in which manufacturers can demonstrate that products comply with relevant EU legislation. They provide a common assessment method for construction products and a single European scheme for declaring product performance. The harmonized standard required that the performance requirements, the verification methods used to examine the various aspects of performance, the assessment criteria used to judge the performance for the intended use and the presumed conditions for the design and execution of products in the construction market are assessed and reviewed to ensure ongoing compliance. So this would include sort of things like the, with performance characteristics, um, the reaction to fire and its resistance to fire, um, its durability of, of fire resistance. Um, these, we also will have assessment and verification of constancy of performance, so ensuring that products remain performing as per the declaration. And from this, that means we would have type testing, so samples will be secured by third parties and uh, they will be tested uh, from the manufacturers to make sure that they still perform as they originally were intended to perform as. Um, and then we also have factory production control um, measures in place which will look at the processes and procedures which are used to maintain and continuous surveillance um, to notify of any modifications or to notify of any one-off type products. Uh, labeling, documentation and information is also covered um, and there are set criteria that has to be followed, um, inspection procedures, uh, product specifications and documentation, um, everything like that. So it goes through the whole chain of custody as such for a product. And, and the idea is to ensure that only products that are safe for use um, are actually put out there on the market or are used on the market. Moving on to the basic fire safety requirements. So the construction products regulation, the CPR, um, lays down harmonized conditions 
for the manufacturing of construction products. So Annex 1 uh, describes how building regulatory requirements should be structured, and it requires construction works to satisf satisfy five basic requirements of fire safety. It notes that the construction works must be designed and built in such a way that in the event of a fire, um, that the load bearing capacity um, can be assumed for a specific period of time, that the generation and spread of fire and smoke within the construction works are limited, that the spread of fire to neighbouring construction works is limited, that occupants can leave the construction works or be rescued by other means, and that the safety of the rescue teams is taken into consideration. These basic requirements can be found within the approved documents and technical guides within England and the devolved nations. So incorporating fire safety from the design stage, um, best practice would be to include third party approved products installed by third party accredited contractors. So before any fire protection material product or system can be placed on the market, it must undergo fire testing appropriate to its designed intent. And generally there are three tiers of evidence used to support products in the market. So third party certification can be presented in a number of forms. You can have its first party, which is an individual or an organization provides goods or services with assurance that they meet certain claims. Uh, second party where an association to which the individual or organization belongs to provides assurance by virtue of its membership. And then third party, which is independent assessment by an accredited certification body, declaring that specified requirements regarding product, person, process and or management systems have been met. So we always recommend um, third party certification due to their experience and necessary knowledge of installing fire protection or fire stopping products properly. Uh, that would then result in a certificate of compliance being issued by the third party approved installer as well. So the, one of the main key distinctions between third party certification and other forms of conformity assessment is their independence. Third party certifiers provide an objective view of a product safety and performance free from both the economic demands of the marketplace and internal uh, company pressures because they have no financial interest in the sale of that product. Uh, this ensures that products meet the specified requirements relating to safety, health and the environment uh, to which they are being evaluated. So third party accreditation or certification is the formal independent recognition that a prescribed standard of performance has been achieved. And if that standard is achieved, the third party provides written assurance or certification that it conforms to the specified requirements. By using third party certified uh, company, customers can be reassured that a contractor will perform to a minimum level of acceptable standards. And contractors that choose the approval route, which is voluntary in the fire protection industry, currently, uh, those that are genuinely committed to quality as they see good customer service as a way to become more profitable themselves. End users can also be reassured that third party certificated companies can help meet the requirements of the fire authorities and insurance companies where necessary. Third party certification bodies, uh, like the companies they approve, need to be uh, benchmarked uh, against certain standards and be publicly accountable. So non-accredited approval and certification bodies will have little value as they're not accountable to any overseeing authority um, and are not um, benchmarked against any relevant standard. In the UK, official accreditation is provided by the government recognised United Kingdom Accreditation Service, which is UCAS. So moving on, we're just going to run through some of the Rockwell, the Rockwell solutions that are available to you for passive fire protection to structural steel. So the main product, which is probably well known in the market, is the FirePro beam clad system. So the beam clad system is tested to the latest harmonized standard, um, 13381 part four. It meets the requirements of the yellow book, fifth edition, when we can offer up to um, insulation and integrity of 240 minutes for beams, columns, uh, angles, channels, and T-sections. We have choice of fixing methods. So we have dry joint and we have a glue joint method and we can cover AV factors up to 350 for the glue joint system and AV factors up to 306 for dry joint systems. 
Uh, cellular beams are usually designed for specific applications, and as such, they will have a limit in temperature calculated from structural model by a specialist manufacturer or a structural engineer. Um, if such a calculated limit in temperature is not available, then we work on a limit in temperature of 450 degrees C. So the, um, the ASFP Yellow Book will give guidance on how the section factors or how the um, AV factors, sorry, should be calculated. Um, so that will look at either the section factor of the I section above the opening, the I section below the opening, or it will take the section factor calculated as 1400 divided by the thickness of the lower web, whichever is the worst case in order to calculate um, the, uh, the thickness of insulation that is required, the protection thickness allowed. Um, we then uh, times the um, that by 1.2 to come up with a conservative thickness, so something that we, we you know we're quite happy that would be sufficient to protect that cellular beam. Uh, looking then at typical beam clad specification. So in order to calculate the thickness of insulation for steel beams and columns, uh, there is certain information required to allow us to calculate. So we need to know um, what type of fire is it like to be. So generally in buildings, we're looking at cellulosic fire protection. Uh, the fire rating that is required. So for example, do we need a one hour or two hour fire protection? Uh, what the limiting or the critical temperature is of that beam, if it's been calculated. If it's not known, then we usually uh, fall back to the 550 degrees C limiting temperature. We need to know what the method of application is, because obviously, as we were saying, if whether or not it's going to be a profile protection or boxed or, um, or solid protection depends on um, the, the surface area of the beam that's likely to be exposed. Uh, so we do need us with the beam clad system we currently only offer a box protection system so our thicknesses would always be based on the boxed um, method of application we need to know the serial size so we can normally get the two sizes which would be the uh, the depth and the width of the section uh, but the one that's generally forgotten is the uh, mass or the volume of the beam which is the third figure uh, we need to know any other factors then as to whether or not whether or not it's a cellular section or anything like that, because obviously the calculation method will vary then for cellular sections. Looking then at any additional considerations. So these um, additional considerations really cover um, areas where we get common questions as to when um, we need to apply um, sort of fire stopping or um, how to treat uh, composite or non-composite floors, things like that. So fires have shown and testing has shown that the behavior of composite steel decks floors play a crucial role in providing inherent fire resistance when compared to tests on isolated construction elements. So the fire test demonstrated that a slab acts as, the, as a heat sink um, for any beams that uh, are supporting it. So we have composite beams, composite floors, sorry, and non-composite floors. So composite action is developed when two load carrying structural elements, such as the concrete floor slab and its supporting steel beam are connected and deflect as a single unit. Um, this connection allows an increase in strength and stiffness and a reduction in steel weight is often possible by taking full advantage of a composite system. It is rare for a steel beam supporting a composite steel deck not to be designed to act compos compositely, i.e. be connected via shear connectors and for it to act together. However, it's not always possible once it's all in place to determine whether it is composite by a visual inspection only. And therefore, in a building where the floor slabs are already in place, confirma confirmation would need to be obtained via an appropriate engineer or alternatively, if it's not possible to determine whether the beam is composite or not, then all voids above the flange would need to be filled. The steel decking uh, used as formwork for concrete floors will either be re-entrant or trapezoidal. So voids above beams supporting floors. So when do we actually need to fill those voids above composite and non-composite beams? So there are preformed blocks available to fill the voids between the deck and the top flange of the beam. Any non-combustible material with a proven fire stopping ability can be used. Where beams are positioned perpendicular to a profile steel deck, voids can be created between the top flange and the metal deck. And generally, small dovetail profiles will require no action, 
whereas the larger trapezoidal uh, openings may need treatment. The treatment for options are to fill the gaps with a suitable product. You can leave it unfilled, but you need to increase the beam's fire protection. So again, the ASFP Yellow Book um, has further information on how you can calculate that. Otherwise, all voids must be filled where the beam forms part of a compartment wall and also where a non-composite beam supports trapezoidal decks, all voids must be filled. So, looking forward, hopefully from the presentation today, we've um, helped to consider the requirements and understand the importance of protecting structural steel elements from fire. Uh, that we understand the regulatory requirements, the guidance and the documents that assist in design and specification to comply with the building regulations. Appreciate the difference between the test standards um, and the transition to the EN test methods. Um, ensure that you will look at all requirements and determine the most suitable protection method based uh, for your application. So again, this is the way we were saying that you need to also consider other um, uh, impacts such as your thermal or your acoustic requirements. Uh, consider where steel wit travels around, how that transfer, um, it can help to transfer vibrations through the structure, resulting in potentially increased noise levels in other areas of the building. Uh, fire protection currently accounts for approximately 10 to 15 percent uh, at the cost of the steel frame for a typical multi-storey commercial building and therefore it can be quite costly um, if you have to think about uh, retrofitting something to provide thermal insulation or acoustic um, isolation uh, after uh, the steel beams are in place. So currently the UK um, imports about 6.5 million tonnes of raw or semi-finished steel a year. Uh, looking forward, um, we've got the ASFP Yellow Book, sorry, uh, sixth edition. Um, so I'm um, not sure if that is due out this year or whether it will now go into 2022. Uh, the limiting temperature for structural steel um, could be lowered. There is discussions around that. Expanding the test scope for the beam clad system. So we are doing additional testing. So we're continually trying to strive to sort of increase the scope of our beam clad system. Um, so we're looking to include multi-layer systems that now needs to be tested uh, separately. Uh, we're looking at larger web depths and we're also looking at um, alternative fixing methods. Uh, there is the growth of the modular construction, which is going to bring um, its own um, you know, issues as far as structural steel or steel work that needs to be protected. The Fire Protection Association report on fire design for modern methods of construction. Obviously, modern methods of construction is growing. And again, um, there is our concerns about the fire protection or tested fire protection methods for modern methods of construction and the green steel strategy. So as I start to say, we currently import around about 6.5 million tonnes of raw or semi-finished steel a year, and we export 8 million tonnes in scrap metal, most of it steel. So the green steel strategy aims to recycle and upcycle the growing amount of scrap steel using electric arc furnaces powered by renewable energy. Uh, so green steel offers the opportunity to reduce those imports and to recycle steel and other metals uh, within the UK. UK. So I think we've got around about a couple of minutes left for um, additional questions. Um, so I will turn my camera back on and we'll see what questions we've got. Thank you. Thanks so much for that, um, Coral. It was a great presentation, very detailed. Um, <laughs> I'd also um, like to um, welcome Rob Wakefield at this point, um, who's a fire certification engineer at Rockwell, um, who's also just going to be joining us for, part, uh, for the Q&A session, um, which I'll try and get through as many questions as I can quite quickly. Um, there are quite a few here that are quite specific and so might be best passed on to the team afterwards. And we will make sure those are all passed on. Um, but one that we did have come in um, quite early in the piece, um, you've obviously outlined a number of solutions um, to, the prob like, to the issue at hand. What are the key considerations firms and professionals need to be making? And I know these are, you did touch on this, but I think a nice people would really appreciate a summary. What are the key considerations firms and professionals should make when deciding which solution is the most appropriate for their project or their design? 
I think one of the main things that we want people to consider here, and it's one of the most common questions that we get asked within our technical department, is um, we're often asked to retrofit insulation, um, insulation steel beams, which are to limit thermal bridging. Um, or for acoustics as well. Acoustics doesn't necessarily come up that often. Um, it's often considered an afterthought, but if you think about steel beams and where they travel around a building, they can actually transfer vibrations right the way along and, and all around the building. So what we ask is for them um, is to consider really is if you were looking and you're, it's in an area where you're likely to, you want to sort of limit the thermal bridging, um, so it can be on soffit protection, things like that. So they might put insulation to a soffit. The steel beams are supporting the underside, you know, the floors, um, and they may require um, thermal insulation to prevent that thermal bridging aspect of it. Um, if they are intermittently coated um, and they require a, a fire rate into those steel beams, then we will then have to treat them and, and treat them as though they do not have any fire rating or any intumescent on them at all. And we treat them as new and we end up having to specify the beam clad. So it works out uh, really that you are applying fire protection twice to that beam. It can be very expensive exercise. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. Um, we've also had a number of questions about testing in terms of transitioning EU to UK. Um, and how that's going to sort of play into this whole um, discussion. Um, if you guys could pick up on any points there that could give people some guidance, I'm sure it'd be much appreciated. I'm looking at Rob now, so I might hand this one over to Rob. <laughs> Being our new city. Well, Rob has just recently joined us again as our certification manager, so um, uh, he have a, might have a bit of a better idea really on where we're going with that at the moment. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Carl. I think there's, yeah, there's two aspects to it really. <laughs> There is um, the, there's the testing side of things, which will pretty much probably stay the same. So reliant on the same European test standards for now. Um, on the C marking um, and um, EAD route, then I guess that's still up in the air, um, looking towards UK CA marking. But how that's going to work with EADs is a little undersized as far as I'm aware at the moment. Um, so we're probably looking for a little more guidance from government on that and how we're going to approach that moving forward. But in terms of how we test the products, then that should stay the same for now. Okay, brilliant. Um, we have we have a series of other questions, but they're all very specific um, example based questions that I think would probably be best addressed on an individual basis. I'm happy to put um, I'll, I'll put one to you now while we're, we've got a minute or so left. So um, how do we deal with local brackets bolted to the beams to support curtain walling? Does anyone have any thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like yeah, um, I'll, I'll try and answer it as best I can. We would look at that on an individual, on a bespoke basis. So we have our own um, fire team um, based within Rockwell. Uh, we have um, expertise within that team to look at doing sort of what we would call engineering judgments and things like that. Um, the likelihood is, is anything that is penetrating that is attached to that beam, we would then need to address by limiting the sort of the heat transfer through to the beam. That's your, that's your greatest risk there, which means that we would have to sleeve it for a certain distance potentially. But again, it's on, it's really, it's, it's very much project by project basis. It's a very sort of detailed and specific to that one. There's no sort of standard detail that we can provide for that scenario. Yeah, completely. And the, the rest of the questions that we have are sort of along a similar track to like individual circumstance questions that I think we'll make sure are passed along um, to Coral and Rob so they have them, um, but probably not super appropriate for like a wide ranging discussion. Um, so I might draw it to a close there. Um, I would like to say um, a huge thanks to both Coral and Rob for joining us today, as well as Rob Hall for sponsoring this session. Um, it's been a really invaluable discussion. That is one of the main pieces of feedback that we've had through the, the questions is just people saying thank you so much for all the insight. Um, so anybody who wants to watch it again, it will also be available on demand um, sort of within half an hour of us signing up here, just needs to process and upload. Um, also our first session from today will also be available on demand um, right now. Um, and that's on the Planning Gateway One reforms. Um, and also just quickly like to flag up, I've got a number of upcoming events that would be great to get in the diary. Next, on Monday, um, we have a session we're being run in conjunction with the Construction Leadership Council from two o'clock to three o'clock in the afternoon um, on the Construct Zero Industry Business Champions and next steps in that um, Construct Zero program. 
um, while we have another session on 8th of July about how technology is supporting the rise in modular construction. So we've got plenty um, to keep in touch with and plenty more um, content in our construction business um, risk and regulation um, program. So thanks again um, to Coral and Rob and Rockpool. Um, and that's all from me. So thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.